<laughs> doing something. Ah, here. Okay, I guess now it works, right? Good? It does. Okay, okay, good. Recording in progress. Okay, got it. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. My name is uh, Mario Geiger, and uh, I will talk about group theory in machine learning. And uh, I'm postdoc in MIT with Professor Teschmidt. So this talk is about equivariant neural networks. So imagine you have a task you have to solve that uh, you know it respects some uh, symmetries. So in this example, it's rotation. So um, what you can do uh, to impose this symmetry from start, because you know that this is a strong uh, bias you have on, on your problem, you can make a neural network, an architecture, that respects this symmetry. So uh, if you rotate the input of uh, your neural network, it will uh, rotate the output the same way. And uh, this can be done in such a way that it's always um, satisfied for any uh, parameters. So even before training. Actually, this uh, animation I'm showing has been collected before training. So I'm really bad at doing presentations, so I tried to do something to, to motivate my talk with a graph of dependencies of what I have to explain to go to my point. So I would like to present what a way to do equivalent neural networks. And then I will want to present um, what can improve data efficiency in equivalent neural networks, what we, we, we discovered, some interesting learning curves. So they show the generalization error as a function of the, the, um, the size of the training set. And we observed that uh, when you add some equivalence, I will explain that, um, it improves the data efficiency. So by following this arrow that shows how, what I have to explain to go to my point, I will have to explain these two architectures that are considered in these two graphics. For that, I will have to explain what is graph convolution and equivalent neural network. And for that, I have to explain some basics of uh, group theory. So let's start with what is a group. So a group is a set of elements with um, a binary operation. Here you have the Wikipedia definition. So um, it has to satisfy three rules. The first is uh, associativity. So A times B times C is equal to A times B times C. Um, the second one is identity. You have an element in, the, in your set such that if you multiply this element by any other element, you stay with the same element. And the last one is that for each element of your set, there is another element in, this, in the set that is the inverse. So if you multiply the two, you get the identity. So let, now let's move to the representations. And because uh, the, my last point is also about uh, equivalent neural networks that are equivalent to rotation, I will start to show examples of representation of rotations because I think it's good to start with examples because representation is a bit abstract if we start with the definition. So the, um, these are a few examples of um, representation of rotations and the simplest one, the most common one, are vectors. So vectors are just three numbers put together and when you make a rotation, they are multiplied by a matrix. So this is a, an example. Another example that is the trivial representation are the scalars. So these are numbers that uh, are, you can have a single number, and when your system undergoes a rotation, they are unaffected by it. And then let's take a representation that is a little bit more fancy. A signal on the sphere is also a representation. Uh, it's a function from the sphere to real numbers. And when you rotate it, you, have, you obtain a new function f prime that is the same as the old function, but evaluated somewhere else, uh, related by the rotation matrix, once again. And finally, let's say a scalar field is also a representation of rotation. It's this time a function from the space R3 to R, and you have the same formula to transform your, your scalar field under rotation. 
So now that, that's, that's the formal definition of group representation. It's a, it's a tuple of two things. You have a, a function rho and a vector space v. And rho is a function from the group into function from v to itself. And it has to aspect these two properties. First of all, it's that rho of g is a linear function. And the second one is more interesting. It, it has to respect the structure of the group. So if you have x, an element of your vector space, and you transform it with rho of g1, and then you get something, again, in your vector space v that you transform with rho of g2, you can do that in one step. You can just transform x directly with rho of g1, uh, sorry, g2 times g1. So now let's move to what are irreducible representation. You, you, are, you have two types of representation. Some are reducible and some are irreducible. So among the example I showed you for rotation, the two first are irreducible and the two last are reducible. What it means is that the two first, you cannot find sub-vector space that are also representation. So you cannot make them smaller representation. They are, they are the smallest. But these two other, these two vector space, um, you can find sub-vector space that are also representation. So let's take the example of the scalar field. I can take this function and I can decompose it on some basis. This is, for instance, the, the orbitals, uh, atomic orbitals. And the atomic orbitals are, are a nice basis with respect to rotation. Because then, each of these coefficients, they transform independently uh, with some irreducible representation. So each of these c, uh, all, all these c together contains the same information as the, the field itself, but each of these C transform independently with an irreducible representation. So these are all the irreducible representation of the group of rotations. They are indexed by uh, index L that goes from zero to infinity. The, the first one, L equals zero, are the scalars. They are dimension one. Uh, the second one, L equal one of the vector, dimension three, and then the dimension is always two L type, uh, two times L plus one, so five, seven, and so on. And here are some example of quantities that transform with these irreducible representations. So what is interesting with the irreducible representation is that every uh, quantity that is a representation can be decomposed into irreducible uh, representation. Take, for instance, this three by three uh, object that is a stress tensor, for instance. It can be decomposed into an L equal one, a zero, and a two. And now this brings me to the tensor product. It's the last operation I need to explain you. Um, you can take two representation, row one and row two. And you can create a new representation by multiplying them together. And this new representation acts on the vector space that is also the tensor product. <laughs> tensor products of um, the vector space v1 and v2. And it works this way. So take x that is in the vector space v1 times v2. So it can be represented as a matrix of dimension uh, v1 times dimension v2. And you simply trans rotate this vector by multiplying on the left by row one of g and on the right by row, one, row two of g transpose. And with indices, you can write it like that. There's no more transpose. You just have k and l. k is contracted with the row one, and l is contracted with row two. And um, when you do the tensor product of two representation, it's uh, uh, typically not, uh, not irreducible, so it's typically reducible. And uh, you can make a change of basis and dec decompose, as everything can be decomposed into irreducible representation. You can also decompose it in an, a direct sum of irreducible representations.
So this is a bit the picture you have. If you have a, a group that you're interested in, you can find the irreducible representation if you go to the library and open the, the right book. And then uh, you can um, make tensor product of these representation and decompose them into other representations. And that's a very great tool that we will use to make equivalent neural networks. So last thing about tensor product is the tensor product uh, for rotation. So this is the rule uh, that works only for rotation. When you do the, the tensor product of uh, the EREPS uh, of index L equal two time the EREPS L equal one, you can decompose it into one plus two plus three, and the general rule is this one. So D of J tensor product with G of K can be decomposed into the, the EREPS from, uh, from J minus K, absolute value, up to J plus K. So uh, now we have all the tools to, to make equivalent neural networks. And uh, the, the building blocks to do that are polynomials. So with the tool I presented, uh, you can build any equivalent polynomials. And I put a little theta here because you can, the, the coefficient of this polynomial, you can make them learnable. So you have learnable equivalent polynomials, which is like a, the only thing you need to make equivalent neural networks. So this is a bit the picture of an equivalent neural network. You, you have an, an input that transforms according to some uh, representations. And you make a layer with uh, these uh, tensor products and direct sum and some parameters. And it gives you some internal representation that will also have some representations. And you can stack these layers together because the composition of equivalent function gives you an equivalent function. So these are uh, a, a, a very non-exhaustive non list uh, of uh, equivalent neural networks that exist in the, in the literature. Uh, so the, the, the most famous one is the convolutional neural network, which is equivalent to translation. Then people came up with uh, um, equivalent, equivalent neural network to the, the 90 degrees rotation. You have just four rotation. It's a very small group. Uh, then people also did rotation in 2D. It's a continuous group of dimension one. Uh, then there is also the scale that has been done, and then 3D rotation. Also people did uh, the um, Lorentz group, and probably much more. That was what came up into my mind. So uh, in my work, what I, I like to do is to make a, a library called e 3 nn that allows to do equivalent neural networks for rotation. You can just install it, pip install e 3 nn And for instance, you can just uh, create spherical harmonics, which is just an example of polynomial uh, that are equivalent to rotations. And that is very useful. Um, so now I have to explain to you what is a graph convolution before I can explain the architecture NEQIP that will be related to the first um, figure of uh, learning uh, curves. So if you have a, a graph, um, uh, the graph convolution uh, is simply uh, that each node sends a signal to each neighbor. So if you focus on, for instance, this node, each uh, node that, that is connected to him sends to him uh, a blue signal Everything is done at the same time like that. So in the architecture NEQIP uh, from Simon Balt Baltzner, um, if you isolate a, a source node and a destination node, uh, this, um, so this, this architecture um, is to make a molecular dynamics. So the nodes here uh, are atoms that have a position in space. Uh, so, uh, given a source node and a destination node, you have a relative distance, R, and the source node has some feature on it. And the message is simply uh, the tensor product 
between the, the source feature and the spherical harmonics up to some um, L of uh, the relative distance. So in this, in this formula, there is, it's missing the parameters and the radial function, but it's not really important for this talk. And uh, this is what has been observed. So these are, this is the mean average error on the prediction of forces. So what they do is that they train a neural network to take a, a position of uh, atoms and types, types of atom and to predict the force that this atom uh, undergo. And um, uh, on the x-axis, you have the number of training uh, data. And the different curves correspond to different um, maximum uh, order of irreducible representation they use for the features and the messages. And they observe that if they use only scalars, they get some learning curve. So they can train it, but it needs a lot of data to reduce the, the, the generalization error. But if they use higher order uh, representation, um, the learning curve has a, a better slope. And the, um, this other architecture uh, is a bit more fancy. So in this architecture, the, the message is not just a function of one neighbor, but new neighbors. So let's say new equal three. You have three neighbors. So you have the feature of the, the three neighbors. You have also these three relative distance to the destination, R1, R2, and R3. And you build this time a big uh, poly equivalent polynomial that I call F theta, it has some parameters. That is uh, just a function of all these features mu multiplied by the spherical harmonics of the relative distance. And um, so um, in this architecture, they have so two parameters, this uh, L, which is the, the maximum representation, irreducible representation they use to, for the features and for the message. And they have also this new, so how many neighbors you take to create this polynomial here. And um, if you take new equal one, you're in the same case as the Nequip architecture. So they observe the same thing, L equal one and two is better than L equal zero. But now, uh, if they increase new, and they can even keep uh, L equal to zero, they also observe this improvement in the learning curve. And what it means is that even if the, the features and the message are just scalars, um, as long as you have uh, enough terms in this polynomial to, to have, um, so if you, ha if you have new equal to two, you can, for instance, take uh, spherical harmonics, uh, they take it up to L equal three, and you can do the, the scalar product of two uh, L equal three spherical harmonic and create a scalar. And uh, uh, it is um, apparently uh, sufficient to improve this um, uh, learning curve and have a better um, generalization, I mean, data efficiency. Um, so in conclusion, uh, equivalent neural networks are more data efficient if they incorporate tensor product of uh, order uh, one, two, three, four, and not only scars. Uh, but it doesn't need to have the features at each, every layer to be uh, L equal, uh, or, or to be of high order, as long as you, you have in, in the, the layers some uh, tensor product of high order, e even though you, you, you go back to scalars, uh, it's, uh, it's fine. So thank you for listening, and uh, the slides are available online. Thank you so much, Mario. Do we have questions in the, in the room? Yes, we do. I will start there. Thanks. Uh, 
I didn't understand the last comment you made on the on the graph of maze. So, new is not just the number of neighbors that you consider for a given destination. It's the num. So, um, so, instead of having just one message per neighbor, you will consider if, let's say, new equal to two, for this node, you will consider every pair of neighbor. So you have this guy and this guy, that is a pair of neighbor. This guy and, and this guy, that is a pair. This guy and this guy, there's a lot of pair of neighbors. You consider all of them, and each pair of neighbor will send you one message. And this message, so here I isolate just one, actually triplets or pair of neighbor. And this pair of neighbor will send you a message that is a polynomial of the spherical harmonics of the relative distance and the feature of on each of these neighbor in this pair. Okay, so you're saying that if you're using, uh, if you're getting messages from the neighbors, from pairs, let's say, instead of uh, just a single uh, particles, I guess, in this case, right? Yes. Because it's MD. Yes. Then you don't need to use vectors in the layers. Uh, exactly, so to, to have a good, uh, you don't, to have a good um, data efficiency, you don't need these uh, feature H to be uh, vectors, they can just be scalars. But because you have, you use two neighbors to create the message, you can uh, have a higher order spherical harmonics of the relative distance that you can scalar product together to get uh, scalars. And um, it's efficiently rich to have a good data efficiency. Thank you. Um, so, in the Nequip uh, figure, is the so so the task is invariant, right? At the end of the day. Um, yes, the task is uh, so th they yeah. want to predict the forces uh, applied on on atoms. But what they do actually, they predict the energy, and they then they take the derivative with respect to the energy. So yes, the task. The task itself is invariant because uh, because you predict the energy, yeah. So uh, and the claim is that even if even if the task is invariant, uh, equi uh, basically a vector representation is better. Exactly, exactly. And can you speculate why this this could be? Um, so I have no idea. Um, <laughs> exactly. So. Uh, um, except that uh, conversions of of uh, examples that show me that it's like the case, I I honestly don't know, because um, uh, I mean it has been proven that uh, you don't need this uh, high order uh, operation to be expressive. You can be expressive enough with just scalars, but in practice we observe that it's better for. G generalization and learning curve and uh, data efficiency. I think this is common, a common thing in neural network. I mean, one, one hidden layer uh, fully connected neural network is expressive enough to express anything. But still, we use deep neural networks with very fancy layers because expressivity is not enough. We need uh, data efficiency. And I don't know how, but it probably induces an implicit bias that helps, but I have no idea. So I have to do the question first, otherwise I have one. Go ahead. I mean, just along those lines, that's what you were saying, Mario. So in practice, uh, it it may seem that simple things may be enough. It may seem that having an architecture that respects exactly the symmetries that you have in your problem is the best choice. But I mean, can can we check, for example, in those in those uh, uh, plots that you show with the data efficiency as a function of how you you construct your equivariant network? What if you compare this with uh, 
let's say, I don't know, a full-blown uh, over-parameterized, not equivalent neural nets, but that you train with data augmentation. I mean, and, and you, of course, you don't uh, incorporate the cost of data augmentation in, in the uh, sample size. Do you, do you always see that it's better to have the equivalence embedded in the, in the network? So for this particular example, uh, this uh, architecture, NEQIP, is um, right now the state of the art from uh, molecular dynamics. So it's better than any other uh, concurrent uh, method that is uh, uh, invariant, uh, that, that, that does not contain this equivalence. But w w with enough data and uh, augmented data, would you learn at some point, the equivariance, the representation you learn, would it be would it be like equivariant polynomials at some point, or? Um, so, with enough data, you can always learn the same thing. You can reach, uh, if you follow this curve, uh, you can always uh, reach any uh, eff e e efficiency. Um, one difference uh, is that if you, tr if you look here, uh, we impose a structure that uh, every layer is an equivalent polynomial. Uh, if uh, your neural network uh, does not impose equ equivalence and it's just uh, a common neural network, by training it, you will, it will learn to be equivalent end-to-end. -end. So uh, from the f input to the output, it will be equivalent. But the intermediary layers will not be equivalent. So you will not have these polynomials in it. Probably it will make, take all the layers to, in the end, make something equivalent that it will learn to become to. Any other comment or questions? OK. This is um, what was touched upon in the previous questions. So I wonder, since you're essentially adding structures with this, can you say anything about the interpretability of this kind of networks? Uh, yes. Uh, I, for sure, it adds interpretability, because now um, your internal rep representation is uh, has a structure and has has types, so you can you can look at these uh, internal uh, neurons and look what they they do and look what these guys do and uh, because of the, the, the their uh, representation, they uh, the vectors can point in can can uh, show direction the scalar cannot, so I don't. I don't have a um, uh, um, work that has been done that I know that uh, exploit this extra interpretability, but uh, for sure it, it, uh, it can lead to better interpretability in theory. So I'm just wondering if there is a, a simple example that you tried where you actually saw that, I don't know, neuron number one does this, neuron number two does that, and they implement some specific operations. Yeah, no, unfortunately, I have nothing in mind uh, like that. Thanks. All right, so maybe we can move to the next speaker. Thank you a lot, Mayo.